So my name is Maxina Marak. I'm from Yokmok, which is way up north in, in Sweden. You probably know where it is because that's how you got into my family. Uh, he's my godfather, so that's our relation. And I was very pleased to, to know about this um, and to get invited to this as well. So I work as an artist in uh, Sahmi, but also in, in Sweden, and I've, I've been traveling quite a lot. I've uh, been to Canada, I've been to Greenland, I'm going back to Greenland actually in two weeks. Um, so I'm very excited about that. And I think one of the reasons why I do get invited to these uh, events, these indigenous events, is also because I'm a political activist um, in a way that is maybe more practical than, than some others. Because uh, I started a rebel group called Chapis Raito. Um, I became a political activist not because I wanted to be an activist, because I was brought up in, in a society where I, it was hard for me to, to just look the other way, um, feeling, knowing, experiencing all these um, issues for Samis and against Samis uh, in Sweden, but also in all of Sahmi. Um, when I when I was growing up, I I really I really felt that I I was missing something. I, I missed a person that could just um, be a rebel to go against these uh, injustices and and to actually act and not just talk about it, not just uh, preach about it but to actually act and, and do action. So I started to do some um, pretty um, heavy uh, manifestations and, and political actions against uh, Swedish uh, politicians um, that became quite known and actually one of, one of the uh, manifestations that me and this group that I created uh, did is actually now being used for um, education in, in all around the world. So I had some friends in Canada that saw it on their university. Uh, we actually, I'm not going to tell you the whole thing how we did it, but it was against uh, the Swedish government. We stopped Alice uh, Bagunke, which is the culture and solid minister in Sweden, um, forced her to listen to a, a manifestation that we wrote, a manifest that we wrote. Um, while I was cutting off my sister's hair. So that's one of the, the things that I've, I've done. I've also um, done Chak is Raido, which is the, uh, the black ride. I don't know what you call it in English. Uh, Caravan. Oh, okay. Um, where, where we actually, yeah, you can find it on YouTube. I'm not going to tell you the whole thing. Um, so I was I started to get called a South Miss uh, terrorist um, because I never backed off, and uh, I I'm very I'm very aware of the situation for the Sami's today, um, and for me traveling a lot, I I also meet so many other indigenous groups where it's so sad, but also a good thing that how we. We can really communi communicate better than on non-indigenous people that live closer to me because we have experienced the same issues and we have so similar histories. So um, some of my best friends today are from Canada. They are also artists. Um, so for me, as an artist, I've, I've used a lot of politics. I work with hip hop. And yoik, so why I started to, to do music was because I was also missing like a, a dance floor for Salmis, which was not that stereotyped. Um, I love the yoik, I, I do it myself. My grandfather is a really great yoiker in Sweden, and Sahmi. Um, but I wanted to develop it, I wanted to take it a step further, I wanted to, to open the doors to Sahmi for the rest of the world um, in maybe a language that that everybody speaks. I mean, music is a language that we all speak. Um, and if I can touch someone through their soul, I mean, that's something that the politicians can't do. Um, so I, I, as when I, when I write my lyrics, I, I do rap and hip hop. 
uh, it's natural for me that it it becomes political, um, and it's natural for me that it that it's about Saab and the Saab is the norm for me. So I'm pretty much I think I'm the only uh, Sami rapper in in Sweden that. Uh, um, do what I do, probably the only one ever <laughs> uh, that does the things that I do with my music. So um, that's a little bit about me. So I'm an artist, I'm a music producer, I produce all my music myself, and I, I use music as a political weapon. Um, and now today, I mean, I started off as an activist, as a nobody before I got famous. Um, and now I've come to some kind of a place where I know a lot of the Swedish um, politicians, and we talk about <laughs> we talk about and and I can see I see some hope for the future definitely, and I think that is um, because I never let them, and I never will. So that's a little bit about me. I don't know what else to tell you, but that I talk along. Um, so I go to you. Is oh. You're not infamous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. It's a pleasure, and I'm really honored to come here. And and, uh, and when I was asked to come here, I was I was saying yes, sure, I will be here. But I had a problem in my schedule to to fit in. That's why I'm going to Ali Club. They have a Sami week, and I will do some lectures and perform as well to tomorrow. So, and I have to go up to tonight. Karina uh, uh, asked me when uh, when were indigenous issues became an issue for me, and I don't know exactly when that was. That was 1977 in Kiruna, when the Second World Council of Indigenous Peoples were held in Kiruna. And I was in my teens uh, uh, that, that year, and uh, then uh, I was really uh, uh, affected by everything that happened. And I went to Canada in 1978 and met a lot of people. And uh, so it started to, uh, to for, for me, uh, realize that we were not the only one in, uh, in, in the world. There, there were other people like us. And uh, in those days, uh, not, not really the same way as uh, Maxida tells about. Uh, uh, we were also using the joy as a, as a tool for showing uh, that we were existed. So wherever there was a microphone, wherever in Sweden, in, in the, everybody was going up there and joking. And we did joy wherever we had a chance. And uh, we were not really good, but the, uh, the, the thing was that we did it. And that's important, uh, uh, that we, we, we used the songs. And, uh, and one of our uh, heroes already then uh, was Johan Marak, the, and uh, Maxida's grandfather. And, uh, uh, and I will say he's the best, and uh, I'm, I always uh, salute him because uh, if it wasn't for him, I, would, I don't think uh, the York would be as strong it, as it is today. So uh, you are Marek is, uh, is uh, my view at least. And uh, when we talk about uh, Hugge, it's uh, hard for us to pron to pronounce his word Hugh, and uh, I was really laughing when I was reading his uh, the Swedish version of uh, Yes to Salmona, the year in Lapland when he uh, when he come in and to your to your hut and they ask for Chu. <laughs> 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 yeah, and uh, and. Um, uh, a lot of uh, things that I read uh, 
uh, at the end of the book he said uh, uh, when they were uh, were migrating from uh, from the mountains down to the forest well and they said this was the last uh, way last time they now is everything was changing when I read this book first time so now that that wasn't really true but after I, I realized that you saw it already the changes I didn't uh, but you were you you were already an elder in those days an elder for a man with uh, full of respect and um, and I realized that you you were really right in that in that perspective. Uh, Hugge was also very early in using, uh, before email was came to to Sweden, he was uh, in Norrkom and I was also, we were Kompisar with two M. Uh, <laughs> and that was, uh, this uh, was kind of a a network was just before email came, and he was the one, uh, the real. You don't remember? <laughs> Not <at all. laughs> there, yeah. there was something. Yeah, right. Yeah, flickered uh, by. It, it was just a pre-internet. Yeah, pre-internet. Anyway, Hugge uh, uh, is. Uh, uh, He's talking with animals, and uh, and I was thinking uh, of uh, of uh, of a reindeer calf, and I have put the song t- to you. Mm-hmm. Etc. Well, I said um, if uh, we didn't have our jokes, we didn't have our stories, we don't have our, uh, uh, we don't, know, we shouldn't know. Now we know Hugge because uh, he has his song. He will <coughs> continue to live as long as we can sing his song. So he will, he will be with us. And also. Uh, I realized that also the Yoi King is, is a, it's a, it's a way of telling a story and also a way of telling a, of a place that you are using. For I have a one example, Sjöldotnjona. It's an area east of Agnitok and, uh, and you cannot find anywhere on the maps the name Sjöldotnjona. And I was thinking, uh, because I had heard 14, 14 different songs of Sjöldunjona describing the area, how good it was for having the reindeer grazing there, and etc. And uh, and I was uh, I was trying to look you know, on the map, where is this uh, Sjöldunjona? Until I realized that it was an area, it's kind of Sjöldun, it's Sjöldun, it's a river. And Nyona is, uh, is um, a peninsula. So this area was like a peninsula between some lakes and the Shelefte River. And, uh, and I was saying, as using the Joik as a historical document, this was fantastic. I could say, this is really, if somebody say, 
the Salmi reindeer, uh, mostly forest ro reindeer herders, have no right to be here. You, I said you can use the Yoik saying this is a historical document that's really interesting and also tells about uh, that we have been in this area. And there are ma many other places where you can find these songs. Uh, that's one uh, reason I think that it's a really good thing to that uh, the joking is very important. Well, uh, I didn't say who I am. Uh, I am. Uh, I'm not from Umi University. I work there. I'm from from the north of uh, uh, close to Kiruna, Levaschero, the Sami view of uh, southern of. Uh, uh, of Kirman, that's where, uh, and my mother is from the uh, forest son from Molos, I have some uh, connections as well to to that. And I uh, working and uh, also teaching, researching on Sami culture in Umeå, and also until another year, uh, one more year, to I'm a chair of the Indigenous Issues Committee at the University of Arctic. So that's all I have to say. I'm saying no more. Thank you. Karina uh, told about the book. I, I'm a co editor of the book. When I was eight years old, I left my home and I haven't come back yet. And it's the Church of Sweden who published it in 2016. Uh, I would like to thank you for this invitation to this seminar. I couldn't uh, come here earlier. I was in another meeting this morning in Stockholm. So, so uh, thank you for coming here. And I have regards from Jenny B. Carlson, who is uh, director of the of our organization. She couldn't come, but she sends regards to you. Uh, I've been studying anthropology one year. But that was a long time ago, and uh, you, you wasn't here, you were free that term, do, no, do you remember? I, well, yeah, I remember you still. Yeah, it was many years ago, but it was a very interesting and funny year here in uh, Uppsala, was it? Uh, I'm from uh, Ariplug, and Christer and I will go there, and I will listen to Christer tomorrow, so I hope we will have a nice concert, Christer together with Katarina Barok. And I come from uh, Saipa Sami village, and uh, I'm coming from a reindeer herding family. So I've been growing up the way as Hugge writes in his uh, book. And uh, uh, we still, my family, they're working with the reindeer herding. Oh, they, so they, they li live on that. And, uh, and I myself, I've been growing up on a boarding school in Ariplug, and so I have Lashandosh also done. So we maybe can talk about that later on. Uh, yes, so I think I'll stop there. So um, the first time I encountered uh, Hugge, it was uh, in 74 in uh, July in a reindeer corral. I think it was Midnight Sun also. And then I was listening on some friends, they were talking about a man called Hugge. And uh, I was, you know, interested in us, who is this Hugge? And I explained he's an American and he's some kind of a, a scientist. Uh, <laughs> and after a while, uh, maybe not at that time, later on I, I found out that he was an anthropologist. And, you know, at that time, you know, I was a young radical and, you know, anthropologists, they were a little bit uh, strange grouping. At least we were a little bit suspicious of that. And. Uh, but later on, I, you know, I made a journey to Uppsala, and it's some kind of a, also some kind of a anthropological journey to learn about Swedes, because they're quite tricky. And um, but also, I realized this when I went to Uppsala. It's not only learn about Swedes, but also about the Western world. So it was some kind of a journey to the uh, heart of or the brain of darkness, you know, you have heard about this uh, uh, this journey to, to the heart of darkness, but anyhow, but 
uh, when I came here, I understand that uh, you know maybe also earlier that Uppsala has been a quite important uh, uh, university town for producing the the myth or the story about the Sami. We can also see the the, the importance of globalization. You know, he's an American, and in the 19 uh, 1673. It was a book published in Uppsala called Laponia, and uh, the author was a, was, a, was a German professor, Johannes Schaeferus. And, uh, and of course he had a lot of contacts with Sami priests who was informing him about the situation. And, and this was a, really a bestseller, and uh, we have to blame this Schaeferus and Uppsala for... for, for, for it, it, partly it made a... I think it made a success, because it was most of the languages in Europe. And the funny thing, this book was published in Swedish in 1956, you know. So it's uh, also tell you a story. But at the same time, if you go further on, we had a, uh, another guy here, uh, but he was much before uh, Hugge at the same time, Carl von Linné. He also went up to the exactly same place as Hugge. And I don't want to, to, to compare them. Uh, uh, that's maybe not necessary. I don't want to... to, to uh, embarrass uh, Miss uh, Linné, but that's, uh, that's another story. And then later on, of course, we had a, this other one, uh, scientist here in Uppsala, that maybe ha it's a part of the dark history, those guys who were working nearby at the, uh, this uh, Institute of Racial Biology. Biology. And uh, that's, uh, that's also a part of this uh, dark story. So I think, and then later on, I, I have been involved with you for many issues. Uh, when I was involved in the big court case, and uh, we had also close contact with with uh, with uh, Hugh about uh, about the matters, and also later on. And of course, uh, he's an American. Of course, uh, you have to understand. That, you know, when I was young, uh, you know, Sweden was some kind of black hole. So to, to find any, any, any that have any reference to me, I had to read American uh, literature. And at that time, you can see films, you can see books. So at the same time, you had the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King. You had Black Power. You had Chavez with the, so much of my my youth, and uh, I was really you can say, and not only the, uh, the myself, but also other uh, Sami youth were inspired by what was going on in the U.S. So we had to export the Sami matter to the U.S. and take it back to Sweden, and then suddenly the Swedes understand, okay, this is a, it's an important matter. So I, therefore, I think uh, this globalization and this contact with the other, uh, other, other uh, nations, and uh, I think also uh, because you know the U.S. have, have an impact, and and uh, and uh, Americans have have impact, and what if Americans say something, Swedes usually listen. I don't know if it's the same. Maybe it's more more problematic with the Russians, but but but, but, but they still listen. So we are living in a global world. Okay, I think I ended it. But uh, but a, a funny story about the indigenous and uh, cooperation with uh, with other indigenous people. Because in the beginning we had a meeting in Vancouver in '76, and of course we had a problem because we are quite white, as you see, and and I didn't understand at that time there is a. The color of your skin is important, uh, so we, we were quite in, in contradiction because uh, during that meeting, some uh, some of our friends wanted to kick out these whites because you know. And then I understand the, the power to be white, and uh, later on uh, they of course accepted this one one evening in the in the bar. So it went quite well. But uh, but then we were a contradiction uh, in one way. We were the, I used to joke that we are probably the only white savages coming from Europe. <laughs> so it is a contradiction to be a European but a still a savage. So it's uh, okay. I think I stopped there. <laughs> Well, um, it's, it's wonderful to be part of this panel and to feel uh, connection with you all, in a, not only because of our Sami engagement, but also in a very personal way. Um, for example, if it hadn't been for the Merak family, I wouldn't be here at all. 
I mean, I would have come, I would have spent, I would have hiked around in the mountains for a summer, and then I would have gone home. It's only thanks to the family of Ida, the Merak family, in, in, in effect, that I'm still here. And so uh, they, they gave me a home, and I, I was able to stay as long as I wanted, and I wanted. And, and uh, similarly, though, in the same way, I can, I can definitely, uh, um, I feel the same way exactly as uh, Christy Stewart. Uh, Yuan Merak is uh, my hero. Uh, not only as a Yoiker, but as a, as a person. And without, without him, I mean, and his whole family, I wouldn't be here. I, I feel that, that when I go back uh, to Yokmuk, I, I, and, and anywhere up in Samilan, I feel, I feel I have kind of an identity through uh, having been kind of grown up as a child, even though I, I was already came as a young man, but still I, 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 came, I was a child in my knowledge of anything about Samilan. So, so I feel I grew up in the family as a kid and learned what I know, everything I know, through that, through, through being there in Yokmuk with the Merrick family and with, through my friends in Torpon Samabi. So I feel a very strong identification uh, with that. I, I, I feel very close to them and I so much appreciate uh, feeling that. Uh, that's one of the, the uh, strong bonds for me. And to have, uh, you know, Elikari here, who I remember well as a, as a student also, and Lars Anders, who I've uh, met uh, from way back in the corrals. Uh, and then the same way, I began to whisper, this guy, he's that guy over there, this small little guy over there, he's a politician, he's a big shot politician. Oh my God. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, so for me, uh, an initial just childhood uh, adventure and love of being out, dealing with, dealing with real people, dealing with practical issues about life and living, in a society, in a group that you can't just push the button and uh, decide whether you're going to chat with them or not. You're always connected to them, and uh, for better or worse, and it's generally for the better, uh, that life with reindeer is what initially inspired me invoked again, finally, uh, after I exhausted every opportunity of staying in Sweden to uh, sign up at the university and then really devote myself to anthropological study, largely based on what I had learned from my time with Gregory Bateson. And so I was using it, it enabled me to see I think, or at least apply a new way of seeing that I, I realized that was not there in, this, in the Swedish uh, anthropological literature about Sami. It was mainly categorizing different forms of reindeer herding as a cultural perspective, whereas I thought uh, I could make it, uh, I can be useful here in applying a systems theory kind of aspect and show what the real determinants are here, and the real determinants are politics, uh, grazing land, of course, and all those things, and, and Swedish legislation and reindeer herding law, how they all combine, to, and the market, the growth of the market economy for reindeer meat, and things like this. It's just a myriad of elements that there are actually can, is far more than just a cultural forum Yokmok intensive herding as opposed to northern Sami extensive herding. Yes, there's that too, but, but there are many, many things that, that influence the way uh, herding has transited and developed. And this, I felt, was a tool which also enabled one to do kind of uh, comparative studies of reindeer herding cultures in different areas, in different ways and not just consider them as just tiny little blips on a cultural map. Um, 
so from there it was very a very easy step uh, since I'm involved in politics and, and and legislation and explaining and trying to look at the rational what we what I call the rationalization process of ranger herding to get into indigenous rights issues on into political ecology through the Chernobyl disaster also on into all kinds of issues that, that I actually think that the Chernobyl disaster has. There are many, many interesting parallels you can make between the reactions of the state and the population then with how one reacts to rapid climatic change. Um, I won't get into that now, but a lot of interesting things there. So that's basically how I got into with many different aspects I've got into. Not to say that the one knocked out the other, it's just it kept expanding and expanding. That's enough. Mm -hmm.